Welcome to The Less Stressed Life, all about making this your time to feel freaking awesome about your life, health, and happiness. This podcast of The Less Stressed Life is hosted by Krista Bigler. Krista is an integrative registered dietitian nutritionist who specializes in reducing food-related stress, inflammation, and symptoms of food sensitivities. To learn more, visit lessstresslife.com. So today on The Less Stressed Life, we have a great topic about reducing stress, honestly. Today, Lindsay Stenovic is joining us. She's a registered dietitian, and she has a whole slew of credentials about being a lactation educator. She's a certified eating disorder registered dietitian, and she's the founder of The Nurtured Mama, a body-positive online community for moms and moms-to-be, and the owner of Nutrition Instincts, a San Diego-based nutrition private practice. She's a mother, speaker, educator, podcast host, food behavior decoder, and body mindset mentor. As a registered dietitian with over eight years of experience in eating disorders, intuitive eating, maternal wellness, and family feeding, and over 15 years of education in the field of nutrition, she works to bridge the gap between motherhood experience, dysfunctional eating, and body image suffering. Her mission is to help women and mothers reduce stress and guilt around food and movement by restoring their trust in their bodies, taking weight obsession out of the equation and redefining health and self-care so much that each woman, mother, and family can thrive. She's the host of the Nurtured Mama podcast, which you might want to go check out, and creator of Eat, Be, Nurture, an online program that helps mamas eat with joy, live in the moment, and nurture their inner power. Lindsay lives in San Diego with her husband, three-year-old son, and is growing another little boy due to arrive in 2018. Welcome, Lindsay. Thanks, Krista. Thanks so much for having me. So you deal with a lot of topics that probably resonate with our listeners, with a lot of people, right? Um, There is a lot of, there can be a lot of stress and guilt around food, not only for our own body image and how we feel about ourselves and what the culture tells us, but also as parents, right? Yeah, absolutely. Stress is a huge thing that I deal with, and especially in respect to just how it how it impacts the way we interact with food and our bodies, the way we feel about food and our bodies. And then, of course, if we're parents, that um, inevitably kind of trick- trickles down um, to the child feeding relationship and uh, take shape in different ways as that child grows and develops. But, um, but yeah, absolutely. That's a huge, huge topic that I focus on with people that I work with. Yeah. Well, I'd love to have you back and we can talk about child feeding because it is a tricky Mm -hmm. topic that I get a lot of questions about. But first, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how Nutrition Instincts began and how you landed in this specialty. Yeah. Okay. So things started in terms of my private practice officially around 2011. When I became a dietitian, I was sure that I wanted to be a private practice dietitian and all that. And so I got my website going and I even trademarked nutrition instincts and kind of got all the groundwork laid, but um, took a few years. Uh, I wanted to get some kind of experience under my belt before diving into private practice. And so I officially did that around 2011, 2012. Um, And that has continued to be an in-person private practice in San Diego where we primarily specialize in the treatment of eating disorders of all all kinds. And we do have, you know, I have continued to have a subspecialty in care for mothers, especially during pregnancy um, with prenatal nutrition uh, throughout the private practice, but that was not necessarily the, the focus of nutrition instincts. And then we also work a ton with people who have a history of chronic dieting. Maybe have never, you know, been diagnosed with an eating disorder, um, but have a significant amount of what I would call dysfunctional eating and body image distress and are looking to heal and reconnect with themselves and move away from that dieting kind of roller coaster that people can get stuck on. Um, and so intuitive eating is um, one of the modalities that we use in practice, among many others, but um, that uh, and, and truly is, is used for those folks who are moving away from, from diets, um, but also appropriately used in the, in the eating disorder uh, treatment space as well. And I have a, 
associate dietitian, I keep saying we, um, I have an associate dietitian who has similar specialties. So we both uh, see clients in that way. Um, so yeah, that's how Nutrition Instincts started. Um, and I've evolved into uh, specializing, specializing even more into the motherhood experience, as you heard in the bio, kind of bridging those gaps. Um, but that's actually primarily online now under the Nurtured Mama. I'm kind of doing doing two different things. Right. But still marry beautifully. And I love mm-hmm. I love to bring some some spotlight to uh, the topic of intuitive eating health at every size, like some of the things that we kind of put into that room of things that are um, that align together. But, you know, I really dig into some of the clinical stuff. And so intuitive eating is still a bit elusive for me, like your specialty and my specialty are so different. And today I'd love to hear and Honestly, for a lot of listeners, I would expect a lot of us maybe aren't necessarily familiar with this um, with this type of eating. And I'd love for you to share all about like what is intuitive eating? How do you know that it's that it's something that you need in your life? And can you dispel some myths around it? So just go ahead and give us kind of the the elevator speech for intuitive eating. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you bring that up too because it's true. Like the integrative functional space and intuitive eating. Um, especially at first glance, feel completely um, on opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, But I actually see some areas where they do, they can and do overlap. Uh, It just depends on timing and what client you're working with and where they're at as to um, what degree that overlap can happen. Um, So yeah, let's kind of dive into, I'll give you kind of the quick and dirty spiel of like, what is intuitive eating? Um, what are, you know, we'll go over the principles real quick. I'll just list like the topics. Um, and then we'll kind of go from there in terms of questions that you have, um, myths that you think are out there that might need to be dispelled or I'll bring some up too. So ultimately intuitive eating is about something called attunement, which is the ability to non-judgmentally um, and effectively integrate both external and in- internal worlds. So you have this internal world of your cognitions and your emotions and your physical sensations and to give value and emphasis to those while also being able to integrate your external environment, other needs that are um, presented based on that Um and, and feeling like you can integrate the two. A lot of people, when they hear of intuitive eating, they think, oh, that just means eating when you're hungry, stopping when you're full. Um, it can very quickly become the hunger fullness diet for people. Like, oh, I can only eat when I'm hungry. I can only stop when I'm full. And that's all this has to do with. But it's actually a pretty intricate um, process of getting, again, getting in touch with what's going on physically, emotionally, and mentally in your body in respect to your environment and your, um, and your nutritional needs and sort of being able to draw conclusions about what that, what that means for you. Um, Evelyn Triboli and Elise Resch coined the term intuitive eating. They wrote the book on it. Uh, I guess if we're looking at it almost a few decades ago now, and they've come out with a, a couple of different revisions since then. So the third revision is their most recent, just for anyone who's looking to dive into their most recent, um, book. And also they just came out with a workbook, which is fabulous as well. So that gives a lot of individualized, um, context to the concepts, which I like. Um, all right. So intuitive eating kind of breaks down into 10 principles that Elise and Evelyn laid out when they wrote their first book, which is reject the diet mentality, honor your hunger, make peace with food, challenge the food police, respect your fullness, Discover the satisfaction factor. Honor your feelings without losing food. I always say to a degree. I think for all of us, we experience this more or less. um, But there's a point at which it can become problematic for people when they're using um, food to manage feelings. And that feels um, not supportive to them. Uh, Respect your body. Exercise and actually feel the difference. And finally, honor your health with gentle nutrition. Um, So that does very intentionally come towards the end of the intuitive eating process. Uh, I'd say in practice, it doesn't always literally come like at the very end where you never talk about nutrition whatsoever. Um, But there's a lot of undoing that has to be done ultimately when people 
need intuitive eating because a lot of people who are turning to intuitive eating have this history with going on and off diets and being kind of ruled by the scale. Um, and through those experiences, they've developed, you know, a wide variety of rules and, um, rigid eating patterns, um, and dysfunctional eating patterns. And so if we were to start with nutrition in the traditional sense that I think as dietitians, we think of nutrition as, um, it's probably going to be more of the same to them. It's kind of not going to be a different process, even though we have well-meaning intentions. Um, it's going to continue the same dialogue that the diets have kind of already laid a foundation for and continue to keep them separated from what's going on in their bodies instead of trying to integrate back with their bodies. And so I actually see a lot of potential and really important potential, I think, for in, for overlap with like the integrative and functional space and things like intuitive eating, thinking of intuitive eating as that base of kind of where are you starting? How how in touch are you with what's going on in your body? How peaceful is your relationship with food to the degree that that can be possible? Because, of course, if people are coming to you from an integrative and functional space, there's something going on for them that um, doesn't feel good. And oftentimes that affects you know, how they feel about food and, how, you know, how, quote, peaceful or not they feel around food um, because food may be affecting their bodies in a certain way that's hurting them. Um or is not supportive to them, but kind of having that foundation of, I can, I can take messages from my body and not judge them. I can feel hunger and not feel that that's like a bad thing or something I'm supposed to manage. I can more so understand it and then respond to it. I can feel varying degrees of fullness without beating myself up about that. Um, or feeling wildly uncomfortable in a quote full body, like having a full amount of food in your body. There are people that can be very adverse to that. Um, because they've been trained uh, through dieting that that's like a bad feeling. Um, understanding, you know, that it's not just about what nutrients are in those foods, that, that there is um, an element of satisfaction that we really have to get as humans. Like we're very complex creatures. Um, and so we need, to, we need to have foods that are pleasing to our palates most of the time. You know, we need to have foods that are adequately nourishing our bodies, which totally relates to nutrition. Um, but there's a, there's a rational part of that, like a, like a factual part of that from a nutritional perspective. And then there's a, what does that actually feel like in your body aspect to it? Um, so that's like kind of a lot, <laughs> a lot of, um, information. I'm kind of curious to hear what questions you have from that or what you think your listeners would want me to elaborate more on. I, I madly write notes a little bit. So I'm going to summarize <laughs> some of the things that I heard. So the myth of intuitive eating is that it's eat when you're hungry and eat until you're full. And that's the myth, right? So it can be this hungry full diet. That's not what intuitive eating is. It was actually, it's been around for decades. It's got a backbone that helps guide it that has 10 principles that you went through really quickly. So maybe we can give a little bit more pause to those. But it's really about kind of taking a holistic view of, ex of of the stressors of all the things that are coming in the the senses and things that are coming into our life. And how are we managing those so we can have the best outcome, right? So identifying the problems and healing them in a way that feels good to us instead of in a way that we feel continue to feel guilty forever as, as some people who need this. Um, you know, honestly, I think we all need this <laughs> um, to be perfectly clear mm -hmm. um, that we can all benefit from this and these principles. So first, let's talk about um, one, how do people start begin tap into this method or two and two, we can kind of separate this out. How do you suggest that like if we're just taking a public health perspective, someone gets started with intuitive eating or these backbones or these principles and, and uses these to guide their health and food relationship? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So on a personal level, I mean, of course, I always give this caveat. I mean, it's going to widely vary based on the individual. And like you were saying, we could all, because we live in a, a culture that is very diet obsessed we could all use the, this to a degree, right? There's like no one that's not impacted by diet culture, but there are people who are obviously more impacted than others. So there are some people who might hear about intuitive eating. They might listen to this podcast and that's almost enough for them. They're like, oh, that makes sense. I've kind of been doing that, but I know that was a thing. And this kind of closes some gaps for me. And 
I'm on my way, you know, and there are other people who, um, you know, read and learn and pour over all of the podcasts and the books, um, and, and still could need that individual work, um, or programs that are out there that help them really hone in on where's the best place to start for them. So I want to just like lay that out from the beginning that there's no right or wrong way per se. Um, what I've learned in my work, what I think actually I will, I will say tends to be the place where I think people run up against a roadblock, um, most often. And so I will actually start there is working through the de-emphasis and moving away from using weight as an indicator of health. Um, so the book starts with rejecting the diet mentality. This totally like lumps in with that, but I actually take that respect your body principle. Um, and I really use that early, early, early on, um, in the, in the first sessions, cause that's something that is so heavily reinforced by our society and culture that, um, it's very difficult for people to move away from. So learning how to be in their bodies the way they are right now, um, and continue to pursue their health and wellness without seeing how their weight responds to that health and wellness work, um, as an indicator of how things are going. So there are people who are healthy and unhealthy at every size across the weight spectrum. And certainly there are things that we can go through that impact our weight one way or another. Um, but ultimately coming back to how do I help myself be well? Um, how do I help care for myself? How do I um, have less judgment and more curiosity, less stress, you know, less anxiety, less guilt around my eating experience and being in my body? Those are things that help us move towards our health. Um, and our weight may do one thing or another, you know, as we move through those things. And that's totally fine. Um, but really bringing that focus to how do we respect our bodies? How do we let our bodies be while we take care of them and, and heal um, and not feel that if we're doing X, Y, Z, let's say with intuitive eating, if we're following our hunger fullness cues and our weight's not going down um, because we heard somewhere online that that's what's supposed to happen, that we're not doing anything wrong um, and that we've kind of turned it into, again, like kind of that hunger fullness diet. So I always start there. I think from a public health perspective, that actually translates pretty well too in terms of what what I wish if I could like change every public health message out there, it would it would be to to one emphasize what's going on for the individual. So yes, we're talking, you know, large numbers when we talk public health and we're talking broad general statements. Um but putting more thought into the kind of questions of, you know, tap into how that feels for you. So, you know, you hear like however many portions of vegetables and fruits that we're going to, we're supposed to have per day. Um, but always bringing it back to how does that feel in your body? How does that actually work? Um, does that feel good to you? Uh, or are you running into some roadblocks with that? And what's that like? What would feel right for you right now? Or what would feel most supportive um, I don't think we do that enough in at least the U.S. when it comes to public health messaging. Um, and we certainly will relate a lot of our wellness advice within the context of weight loss, which just kind of derails things right off the bat for people. Because, again, they could make the changes that are suggested, but if their bodies don't lose weight as a result of that, which is highly likely, um, they get really confused and think there's something wrong with my body. There's something wrong with the way I'm doing this. I must have not, you know, made the right choice or whatever. And so either things get more extreme or they throw that change completely out the window. Um, and it just doesn't really move people towards wellness um, in the way that I think it's intended when it's shared. So th that's actually where I tend to find we we need to start to lay that foundation. Um this is where we align 100% yeah. <laughs> completely because I used to have a tagline called eat to feel your best, right? Because, you know, honestly, when people call me about weight loss, I'm like, well, weight is a side effect of something else, right? That's not the issue. The issue is how you feel about yourself, um, 
how are certain foods behaving for you? Are they inflammatory for you? Are they causing, you know, the reason this podcast is called The Less Stressed Life is because of inflammation, right? Inflam- stress is another word for inflammation, but we can we can apply that to multiple areas in our life. So when you say that you want to emphasize, you know, what, how does that feel for you? That's exactly what I want my clients to think as well. Like, let's tune in to all the signs and symptoms our body is giving us and to how we feel because we can feel a lot better, right? We can feel a lot better in multiple ways. And I have another thing, um, how I'm hearing this, this is like, so this quote, I'll probably butcher a little bit, but I have been reading the miracle morning and there's a lot of great quotes in it. And it, and, and one of them was that you'll never grow be, beyond your personal, your level of personal development. And I found that was really true when I started using personal development a couple of years ago, all of a sudden my life was up leveled, everything started to improve and it continues to improve on the relation, you know, as I work on those pieces of myself, because if you're not cognizant or conscious of how they are, how can you improve them? And so this was really the personal development side of health, right? So this is a phase that we all need. It's really personal development for health and how we all need to kind of tune into how we're feeling and that our, we'll never grow beyond our current health if we don't have a good foundation of personal development. This is really, um, you know, this is really redefining maybe the foundation that you've seen for yourself of what health means. Yeah, I completely agree. I see it as very much so foundational, especially um, to be able to fully benefit from integrative and functional work. Because if you're constantly in guilt and thinking of weight as this indicator of if things are okay or not, you can't truly hear, you know, the science and you can't truly hear what's going on in your body and you can't truly assess whether or not the interventions that you're working through are effective because you're not connected with your with yourself. Or if you do connect with yourself, it feels wildly uncomfortable and triggering and you feel lots of different emotions about it. Um, and you're not even sure how to process those emotions. So yeah, to have that like foundation. Um, and I also, you know, I love, I've been, you've, you know, you know, I've been diving into the integrative and functional space to learn from you all. Cause it's just so fascinating, um, to really re- get back to the roots of the science. And then of course build on that because there's a lot of things you all, um, are so, um, knowledgeable about that, of course, we didn't even dive into in undergrad. Um, But I also am able to see how if one of my clients were to jump into one of those groups, it could be wildly triggering, right? Mm -hmm. But for me, I have a completely healthy relationship with food, I can look at it objectively. And I can also look at what's going on in my body, much more objectively, and from a curiosity perspective, and I can read all I want about that stuff and take what I think is helpful and leave what I think doesn't apply to me or a client or whatever. Um, and so I always like my goal for a client, which doesn't always pan out just because it is very intricate long-term work is to be able to get them to a point where this information is not triggering for them. Like they can, they know like what their needs are. They know themselves so well, they can go, I'm ready for this or I'm not, I need this or I'm not. That sounds, that sounds like it's for me or Nope, I'm not going down that road. Um, so yeah, that's always, you know, my dream goal <laughs> to get every client to is that they get to that last stage of gentle nutrition, at least, you know, that they can um, not feel so um, triggered by even words like healthy. I mean, ultimately, in the intuitive eating space, we're very adverse to things like even the word healthy. But really, when you think about it, it was it's diet culture that makes that word so so loaded and triggering and it connects healthy with weight, which we all in the space that we work in, in intuitive eating and in yours, we see how debilitating that can be um, to wellness. And, you know, there's a whole social justice aspect to it that we might not even dive into. But um, it's just that now I just lost my train of thought, but, um, la, 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 the dis- just the disconnection there, um, ultimately, or really the reconnection that we're, we're trying to, to really get to, to be able to integrate nutrition again without feeling like that's a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, well, my wheels sense? are, yeah, absolutely. I'm like highlighting and making some notes. So I feel more motivated as a result of our conversation to, you know, add an, in, in, or, uh, an intuitive eating or someone with this specialty to my practice, because I feel like we need to be able to have both um, as a resource for our clients. And I feel like I need to implement 
um, really an assessment for new clients. Like, let's assess your relationship with food. Is that where you need to start? Or are you ready to start in some of this deeper work to get you what you need? And, you know, honestly, sometimes, you know, I can, I can see it go both ways a little bit, regardless, we need this foundation, right? So I don't need to go off on that tangent. Like sometimes as we start to heal our bodies from a physical perspective, despite what that is, right? Like I'm not necessarily talking about weight, but other issues, it can help us on this journey as well, because we can start everything can start to feel a little better. Because when your whole life is consumed by your physical abnormality, whether it's in your eyes or whatever, um, it can be kind of hard to focus on some of this stuff, right, from a perspective yep. of the client. So I can see it go both ways. And I just, this has been a great conversation. Like, I've learned a lot from this, and I hope that our audience does too. So um, I have a couple more questions for you. Um, so how do people find someone that specializes in this if they're listening to this and say, yeah, I need this? Oh, yeah, good question. And I just want to say I completely 100% agree with what you just said. It's extremely difficult to have a healthy relationship with food when food is causing you intense digestive distress or, you know, you're having um, physical ailments that you believe are connected to food and are looking into why that is. Um, So I totally agree. For a lot of people, it's like that chicken and egg Mm -hmm. scenario. So being able to like hold both, hold spaces for both um, and really tease out both, um, I think ultimately is, is really effective and helpful for people. Um, So how do people find professionals who specialize in intuitive eating? Well, one way way that they can do that is to look for people who are um, certified intuitive eating counselors. So they actually go on to intuitiveeating.com and look for providers under there. So you look for, um, I'm sorry, not intuitiveeating.com, intuitiveeating.org, and then click on certified counselors. So that's one way. you can always look to providers who work in the eating disorder space um, through groups like IADEP, IAEDP, International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals, and look for people who are certified as certified eating disorder uh, specialists or dietitians, uh, just depending on what you feel your most appropriate needs are. Um, And then looking for health at every size professionals, there's a website called the Association for Size Diversity and Health, ASDA, as we call it, and you can find health at every size providers there. Oftentimes, you know, you can have pretty good success typing in intuitive eating dietitian, let's say, and you'll find people either who are near you um, or there are a lot of providers who are doing online services um, in the intuitive eating space. And there's also a wide variety of programs out there that you can, that you can dive into as well. If you're thinking, this is interesting to me, I want to dip more than just a toe in, but I'm not ready to work or invest in working with someone individually. Um, there's a lot of great online courses and programs out there that you'll be able to find as well with just like quick Google search, um, from searching through, uh, podcasts and, and such. So, this has been really useful for really opening up our eyes, dispelling the myths. Um, and so if you had to leave the audience with your gut reaction that you might tell someone that feels like everything you've said is the biggest breath of fresh air that they've ever heard in terms of diet culture, <laughs> what would you leave them with? I would say you're not alone. <laughs> Many of us have gone through that experience um, where you really start to go, oh, I can like own what's going on in my body. And I realize now why this hasn't been feeling good for me or hasn't been working. Like this portion size that someone's been telling me to follow feels awful to me. And now I'm starting to understand why that might be um, or whatever. You know, we have all gone through that transition at one point or, or another For those of us, especially who work in this space or have um, done work in this space, I'd say you're not alone. Um, I'd say continue learning about it um, and find supportive groups uh, or professionals where you can go and kind of hang out in there and sort of talk about your experiences with moving through the material, what things don't feel like they're driving for you and why that might be and get support with that. Um, because it is very, you know, diet culture is so insidious that when you start to kind of see things for what they are, it can be very confusing or actually pretty distressing sometimes. 
Um, so I think getting that like community support from others who are also kind of moving through it can be really helpful too. Uh, and there's lots of different online groups, Facebook groups for that as well. Um, but ultimately like what's going on in your body feedback you get from yourself based on how you interact with the world matters. It is valuable. Um, you don't, you know, living your life completely, you know, in this mindset of whatever anybody else tells me is the end all be all and whatever my body's reaction to must be wrong. If that person said, this is how I should be feeling. Um, that that's, you know, that you don't have to live like that. Like you have valuable information coming from your body, your thoughts, your knowledge, your connection with yourself and, and to find providers that help you integrate what they're giving you as support and advice with kind of how that, that feels in your body. So I think that's what I would leave. I would leave people with. <laughs> you are just, you have, you're like a fountain of, of knowledge, personal, of, of personal <laughs> development of health, Lindsay. So tell, tell I us. like that. I like that. Reef. Personal development yeah. in the health space. Love it. So where can people find you? Yeah. So people can find me either at nutritioninstincts.com or the nurtured mama.club. So for any mamas who are, or moms to be who are out there listening to this, you would probably find uh, the nurtured mama.club resources, particularly supportive just because we go through intuitive eating kind of through the lens of motherhood. Um, I have an online Facebook group that's free. You can just type into Facebook, either the nurtured mama community, or you can go to nurtured mama. The nurtured mama.club and opt in there. You just click a button and it'll take you to the Facebook group to request to join. And there's a bunch of different free resources um, as well as programs and support groups uh, available there. And um, if you're in San Diego, check out nutritioninstincts.com. And other than that, I'm kind of all over social media, mostly under the Nurtured Mama. Awesome. I'll be in San Diego in a couple months, so I'll be checking uh, yeah. out Nutrition and Instincts. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Let me know. Yeah, I will. Together. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. Yes. Thank you so much for having me on. I truly appreciate it. You are wonderful. Thanks. One of the best gifts you could give us at The Less Stress Life is your feedback. We are paid in podcast reviews. If you enjoyed this or any other episode, please leave us a review. In the iTunes store or from your podcast app, just search for Less Stress Life as if you're not already subscribed. Click on the banana face image, scroll to the bottom where it shows the text of other reviews, and write a review. While you're there, hey, make sure you hit subscribe. For Android or Stitcher users, you gotta go to the desktop site and search for Less Stress Life and then scroll down to leave a review. Stitcher doesn't load Apple reviews on their site, so if you want, you can leave a review in both places. Your feedback means a lot to the success of the show. Thanks so much for taking the time to do that. You rock.